Hello and welcome back to the Goodman Lab podcast. Today what? on the show, we'll be doing what we always do, which is take a small and inconsequential aspect of human health and fitness, make it sound much more important than it is, and confuse you with a host of complicated science and studies that may or may not actually support the point that I'm trying to make. Thank you for joining us. Uh-huh. You ever watch any TV shows where there's a cold open that has absolutely nothing to do with the show, but they're really funny? I guess Saturday Night Live comes to mind. I mean, it's not. Yeah, SNL always did it. Brooklyn Nine Nine always does it. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Abbott Element- yeah. Elementary does the same thing. So, for those of you who are confused, we are still at the Obvious Choice Podcast. That's just me being a sarcastic asshole. And today we're going to be talking about habits, routines. We're going to be talking about things that. Uh, can help you figure out when is your best time to work, uh, particularly like protecting your best hours of the day mm-hmm. and then helping you get into the flow and then stay in the flow when you get distracted. Uh, I mean, I'm not perfect at this. I don't think anybody is, but I can't think of a more important topic if you work for yourself or at least kind of like decide your own hours these days because of just the amount of insane distractions and notifications and beeps and bops that pull our attention away. I really honestly think that if you can do like 30 minutes, like like only 30 minutes a day of proactive work that's actually focused, you're probably in the top 95 to 99th percentile. And if you can do that consistently, you will get ahead very, very quickly. Time is not time is not time, right? I mean, obviously all time is equal, but it doesn't seem like that. Sit on a transatlantic flight with a toddler and eight hours feels like it takes a very long time. (laughs) Well, that's the amount of time that most people have in their workday. And it doesn't feel like very much. Because you're constantly task switching, you're jumping to social media, you're responding to this email, you're responding to that, you're procrastinating from doing the work, you're checking your email for the 27th time, you're doom scrolling, you're whatever you're doing, and we all do it, don't get me wrong. This is not me saying that I'm holier than thou, but point is, there, there probably is more than enough time in the day, it's just a matter of kind of jumping on it. So there's going to be some philosophical stuff that we're going to talk about there's also going to be some very specific like tactical things just like a little free software application that i use for example uh where do you guys want to start with this amber and we could talk about like you guys know some of the stuff that i do because you've read some of my books you've seen me talk about some of this before uh we talk about morning routine we can talk about uh getting like triggered into work I don't know. What do you think is the best place to start? I've got an idea, and it's something that you mentioned on the podcast before. And maybe you'll refer back to the previous podcast where you mentioned it. I don't know what's on which podcast, but I like the idea about the creative side of your brain and that sort of rule that you have that I can do this or absolutely nothing. Either I'm allowed to write within this window or oh. wander off. And do absolutely okay. nothing. I think that's a really, I think it's a very specific way of thinking about creative time. And I think a lot of our students, especially, really struggle with creative time, um, particularly when they're asking about content. Not that that's the most important thing, but that wasn't, that's, that's that wasn't even way. in my notes, but I can talk yeah. about that. That's cool. Yeah. Do it, do it, John. How many pages of notes do you have there? I just uh, want to know. Two pages of notes. I got one, okay. two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got eight, eight. Okay. Um, things that I that I jotted okay. down to okay. talk about so I... some references and stories. So, but I can talk about this one first. I like this one. Yeah. This comes from a story uh, from one of my favorite authors, whose name is Neil Gaiman. And Neil Gaiman, for those of you who don't know, fabulous author, but also unique in that he's written a really wide variety of stuff, from comics like Sandman comics to conventional fiction to nonfiction to short story to children's books. And I really admire that, and that's actually kind of what I hope to do 
at some point as well. Um, I've written a children's book with my wife. I've obviously done a lot of nonfiction. I've done a textbook. I'd love to dabble in fiction at some point in the not so distant future. And so, um, so I've always enjoyed his ability to create in a lot of different ways and consistently over a long period of time. So I've read a lot about like the type of stuff that he did that allowed him to do it. And one of the things that he says is, I give myself a block of time. I think he said two hours. Maybe I'm just making that up. I do two hours. He says, I give myself a block of time and I go down to my little gazebo by the water. I guess he's British. So I don't know. It sounds better when he says it, but he's like, I go down to my little gazebo by the water. <laughs> and he talks about his fountain pen and how he likes writing with his pen. Again, he's British. So I guess that makes more sense. And I give myself two options. I can write or I cannot write. And both are okay, but I'm not allowed to do anything else. And after a little while, not writing becomes very uninteresting. <laughs> and I get so bored that I say, well, damn, I may as well write something. <laughs> but I love that because that's it's such a black and white rule. I mean, there's this misconception that rules like that actually stop us from doing things and and the truth of the matter is that structure breeds freedom the more structure that we have particularly self-imposed structure the more rigidity that we impose in our own lives the more freedom to create the more freedom to do things that we actually do it has to be self-imposed it can't be somebody else saying you have to do this but if you sit down and you say i am sitting down for the next two hours and I can either work on this thing and think about this thing or do nothing. And I think that or do nothing is very important because some days you're going to be a sack of shit and you're just going to have nothing in you. <laughs> and I think that's okay. You can't beat yourself up for that. But most of the time that will then stop you from something called task switching, which I'll get into. Um, it was going to be the second thing that I talk about. We talk about it first. I think that task switching, I think that um, multitasking, Amber, you and I spoke about this a couple of weeks back, is one of the most damaging practices that you can do. It used to be like admirable. People used to brag about how they were able to do multiple things at a time and how they could they could multitask. The research is so clear that you 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 can't do more than one thing even decently let alone really well. You might be able to accomplish a few different things, but you're not doing any of them good. And you get way more out of focusing and doing one thing really, really well. During a work block, like during one of those, usually I do it in two hours, not always, but usually I do it in two hours. During that work block, the knee-jerk habit whenever you run into like a block in the work or a hard section or something you need to think about or you're transitioning from one thing to the next thing, the knee-jerk reaction is to do something that feels good, that gives you an immediate reward, like checking social media, like email. Because all of those things give you a reward. It might not seem like it because it might make you feel horrible about yourself, but there's there's an immediate feedback loop and our brains kind of crave that. And so it's really important to just practice sitting there in the mud, sitting there in the dirt. And so if you know that in advance, you say for these two hours, I can, let's say you're writing, and it doesn't have to be writing, right? It has to be proactive work, something that you're actively doing to move yourself or your business forward. Uh, but it doesn't have to be writing. For me, it often is. It doesn't have to be for you. But if you know that those two hours, you're either doing it or you're sitting there doing nothing, you can fight that task switching urge a lot better. And that practice of, you know, your hands are on the keyboard and I'm like itching to like, F A C E enter, you know, I'm like, I'm like itching to type that, that practice of just sitting there mentally over time makes you much stronger. And I have found that the connections that I'm able to make, the ideas that I'm able to 
come up with inevitably almost always come after I've stopped myself from flipping off to something else. You know, like I get to like a section in a book where I'm trying to make a connection between two things and um, it's a little bit difficult. You just sit there for a second. I'm not actually thinking about it necessarily. I'm sitting there and saying, God damn, I'm a failure. How am I going to finish this goddamn thing? <laughs> but you just got to sit with it sometimes. So I don't have anything like any like sage tips other than recognize that it is a very important thing to do when you're working to sit there and stare at the screen or just stare at your notebook or do nothing until you're ready to just zone back into the thing. And the easiest way to do that is in advance say, this is the amount of time I'm focusing on this thing. The internet can wait. Nothing is going to magically happen when I update social media that's going to uh, be life-changing in those two hours. And even if it does, I'll find out in an hour and 55 minutes. Like, that's fine. Is that what you were getting at, when when you, yeah, when you wanted it, to talk about that? Absolutely. And and, and the, my immediately, I think, well, Amber, how does that sound to you? Uh, <laughs> because I know you work from a different space. Uh, like... And I'm thinking, well, that shit would drive Amber crazy, maybe. Uh, uh, I, I am I wrong? No, there's no way. Um, <laughs> so f- f- that would make me so wildly anxious <laughs> to do that. So one one of the things. Um, so I, I know we've talked about it before, but you know, Nate's autistic, right? And so one of the really big things that I've learned before imposing a demand, he needs to be regulated. And Nate, I'm Nate the exact same. Doesn't know is Amber's son. Yeah, so he's five, um, and he he speaks to a certain extent, but not you know um, not at his peer level. And anytime that you're that I want him to do something, I have to make sure that he is well regulated because he has certain sensory needs. So jumping, crashing, um, being squeezed really tight, you know, things like that. And so I can't impose a demand on him until he's regulated. And most people are like that just at different levels. I know I'm very much like that. If I'm not able to get myself to do something, I'm not well regulated. And so me forcing myself to sit still and like do this thing would not like, I mean, I know you guys see me, I'm constantly fiddling with shit on the podcast, right? Like I can't sit still. Um, and so for me, the way that I would handle that is by doing something monotonous. And so like, that's why I'm caught, like, I repaint my house. I don't know how, you know, all the time, um, or, you know, certain cleaning tasks, things like that. And it helps me relax my body. So my brain can think. So I do the same thing. Mm. So I do the same thing. I, I constantly am like playing with something in my mm-hmm. hand. Um, in university, I remember when I was studying, I discovered this, I would, I would whip off a piece of paper off of a, mm-hmm. off a notebook or something. And I would just roll the piece of paper in my fingers. Yep. So as I'd be sitting, as I'd be studying to do something with my fingers, because I, I, I used to, I still do a fair bit, but I used to a lot more. I used to just bite the shit out of my fingers, like, like cute. Yep. And that's just a nervous habit. That's just having to do something. So now, similar to you, I just always have to be doing something. When I'm a guest on podcasts, I always make sure that I have something in my hand. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll, you'll see it sometimes. When yeah. I'm doing it on, on our podcast a little bit less because it's me talking for the most part. It's, yeah. and so I can control the experience a fair bit more, mm-hmm. but, uh, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about morning, morning routines. Ooh. Can we do that? We yeah. Mm-hmm. that. I like this. I have a bunch of notes on this one. So I said at the beginning of the, of the podcast after the, part where I shit on Andrew Huberman um, because I woke up and chose violence today. I I said that um, he's just like he's figured out how to market health and fitness information. Like I don't have anything against him, but you can't there's not that much that matters to necessitate like a podcast that 
goes out multiple times a week about health and fitness. Like there just isn't new stuff that you can talk about. And so you're kind of forced by design to make things that don't matter much sound like they matter a lot more than they do. And then the way to market health and fitness information is just to make it sound way more complicated and sciencey than it needs to. Uh, so anyway, I woke up and chose violence. You it's not so much him. Emails. It's just more like a matter of, like he does it really well. Uh, it's just a matter of the thing. Uh, but I talked about at the beginning of the podcast after that, you know, 30 minutes to an hour of really good time. And so in, in, in doing that over the years, what I've discovered for me is that my best brain hours are first thing in the morning. Like I'm talking the ass crack of dawn. And I don't like waking up early. Like every single morning when my alarm goes off at 5 a.m., I start negotiating with myself about whether I can sleep in or not. Like I'm the one who set the alarm, but like a part of my brain is like, but if you don't, you'll be more well rested and then your brain will be more well rested and then you'll be able to do better work later on. And I'm like, no, I've been through this before, brain. I know that my best time, even if I'm tired, <laughs> is 5 a.m. and I can rest later on. It's like, all right, fine. Get your ass up and drink that coffee. And so I know that that's my best time. Now, it might not be for you. Some people say their best time is at night. Some people say it's the middle of the day, right? The, the point is when you discover what that best time is for you, you got to protect it. You got to really protect it. And that means eliminating all distractions. I like the 5M, I think, more than anything else because there's no built in distractions. But that mm -hmm. means eliminating all distractions. That also means preparing for that time so that you have as much of that time as possible. It doesn't mean, oh, it's whatever, 5 a.m. Um, I'm going to start setting up my things now. It's like I wake up. And I've set everything up the night before. Everything. And so here's, here's just a few sort of like elements to consider um, when doing that. And so the night before, I set up my favorite drink. So I'll set up my coffee. Like I'll grind the coffee beans. I'll fill the kettle. I'll put a mug out with a spoon with my honey. Like it's set up, ready to go so that I just have to flick on the kettle. I'll queue up. I have a song. I'm going to talk about triggers in a little bit, but I have a song that begins every single creative writing session and it's the same song and it just cues my brain to like work that way. So I'll actually queue it up. Like it is loaded in Spotify. Um, any notes that I have, anything I'm working on is already pulled up on my computer or beside my computer ready to go the night before. So my computer is laid out the night before I'll have opened the section that I'm working on. And then any notes that I have to have will be right beside me again, everything the night before uh, my headphones right beside it and all of my clothing, because I'm doing it first thing in the morning will be ready to go. Like I, I like to wear like a hood and like sweatpants right when I'm writing. And so that will, again, be set up the night before in the same spot every single time. So I can basically fall out of bed and not think about anything else and get right into it. The most important thing about all of this is preparing in advance for that really important focus time. Um, Anything like this, this time should be proactive. Again, for me, it's writing for other people. It might be content creation. It might be like working on a business plan. It might be building programs for like, like program templates. Like it shouldn't be like a responsive thing. Like you're building something for one client. It should be something to bring you business forward, but like posting on social media, taking care of your own clients, putting out fires in your business, like all of that can wait. During this protected time, you're only going to focus on the tasks that you've decided will move your business forward. And the idea with this is 30 minutes to an hour of constant forward momentum is actually all that you need. I don't think that there's a steady state in business. Um, I think that you're either getting ahead or you're falling behind. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's how I prepare myself, uh, I guess. And then the final thing is I turn on, this is just like a piece of tech, but uh, there's a there's a free like website blocker. Basically, you can set it to block whatever you want. And the one that I use is called self-control. It's free. You download it to your computer and it's called self-control and you can set it for a certain amount of time. You just go, I, I just Google self-control app. And, um, and you set whatever websites you want. So mine just blocks like social media and Slack and email and that kind of thing. And you just set it to go and you set it for a certain amount of time. For me, it's two hours when I'm doing that in the morning and it, it won't let you access it on your computer. So every time you fail, uh, and you type in Facebook or whatever it is, and you press enter, it just takes you to a dead page. Uh, so an app like that helps as well. So I turn on that website blocker um, first thing in the morning. It sounds like friction. Um, I like to talk about friction a lot in 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 conversations with my clients, increasing friction between things that you don't want to be involved in. Uh, reducing friction for things that you do want to be involved in. And it sounds like what you've done in your morning routine is you reduced all the friction. There's no friction of deciding what clothing to put on. There's no friction of figuring out uh, where the coffee mug is, or if the coffee beans have been ground, there's no friction Mm -hmm. in deciding uh, in finding your notes from the previous writing session to get the, like you've reduced all the morning friction in addition to utilizing the time that you know that your brain best creates, uh, it makes it a lot easier to be successful. And, and, and it makes it, you know, the other thing is it makes it a lot easier to have a successful 30 minutes because you can imagine right. people out there spending the 30 minutes setting up the 30 minutes. <laughs> and that's a problem. Up the 30 minutes or getting your brain like cued into it. Yeah. I find, I find it takes a while for me to get focused into a task. And I used to have effectively unlimited amounts of time. Well, now I have like very specific blocks of time that I work. I mean, by seven o'clock, my kids are awake. I'm making breakfast and I'm making lunch for Calvin. And, And the middle of the day is kind of the same thing. I have like very specific blocks that I work. And I'm constantly in this state of like getting into focus and then having to go do something. And then I have to get back into focus. And that's why once the, once the day starts and the world starts like distracting me, I mean, my family, business, whatever it is, I just like, I'm useless. Like I can't do it. I don't know how, maybe other people have figured out how to, but I, I can't do it. If I have a productive work session after 9 a.m., it's like a magical day for me. I just can't do it. There's just, there's just, there is too much temptation there was too much distraction in the middle of the day. Um, so, yeah. So I, I remove as much friction as possible, both for the time, but also just for mental fatigue. I mean, we're going to talk about decision fatigue here in a little bit. But um, but also just to, like, I need all of my brain for that time. Like, that's all I got, man, uh, to to get into it. So whatever that time is for you, And it might be worth testing it out. And it also happens, like, depends on your schedule, too, especially if you have a family. It's got to be around your family this time, um, which can be difficult. You know, like, my wife wouldn't be able to do it at 5 a.m. because she goes to the kids if they're up at 5 a.m., which sometimes happens, like this morning when Jane woke up at 5.30. Uh, And so the worst thing ever is when you wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning and (laughs) to work and then at 5 15 you got to go tend to a kid and you're like oh i woke up to do this work and now i didn't even get any of it done next up triggers so this is just one more thing that just helps me get into like a state of work again there's just so many distractions i have in the past actually used a separate computer to write books and that computer had no internet connection And that computer had nothing on it other than a word processor. And I'm not the only one who did this. Um, The Game of Thrones author, uh, George R. R. Martin, I think his name is, Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, he wrote all of the Game of Thrones books on this like 1990. Like I don't even remember what it was called, but I think I think the word processor that he wrote it on was called like Word Star, like 90 or something. <laughs> it was like this 1990 like word processor, and it had no autocorrect. It had no. It had nothing. It just like what you typed in was what was on the screen. And he said he said for two reasons. He's like one. I got so many complicated names and shit in there. I just be like correcting Everything the computer's be red. corrections. <laughs> yeah, constantly. <laughs> or like Scrivener. Oh, what fucking I red use. swiggles. Well, look at this. The Scrivener, what I use, actually makes the change. It doesn't even squiggle. Mm-hmm. It just makes the change. And I'll be rereading it. And I'm like, I didn't type that. And And it's actually like, it's hard to force it to say a word. So like I, there's a friend of mine who I talk about in the book. Her name is Rowena. R-H-O-W-E-N-A. To get this thing to accept that name right. is a pain in the ass. And I write her name like five times. <laughs> so right. I'm constantly... So anyway, so he does that. But then he's also like, there's no distractions. When I sit down to write, like, that's the computer I write on. All right. And so I have done that in the past too. But what what works for me now is... I have two basically triggers that just, I don't know what the best way to explain this is. It's just like, you know, when you're going up and doing a squat or you're going up and doing a lift in the gym and you always set up to that lift the same way and you start to do it unconsciously. It's a motor cue, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like I, we had a heavy deadlift session at the gym today uh, and I told the internet, so now it counts. And so it was, <laughs> you know, every single time I start four or five steps away from the bar. And when it's time for me to do the lift, I walk up to the bar. I tap my right shin against it. I tap my left shin against it. I dig in. I grab the bar. I rotate my hands. Like I like create tension on it. And then I pull my butt down and I rip the thing up. Like every single time it's that sequence of events. And my guess is as I'm talking about this, you're thinking about your own lifting too. And you're like, yeah, like I do the same thing. And so we use triggers unconsciously to get into it, but, but very few people do it with work. And I started to do it with work too. So I take off my watch, my Casio, and I put it on the left side of my computer. And then I turn on the same song every single time, which is a song by this guitar duo named Rodrigo y Gabriela. And it's this beautiful song, Temukin, I think is how you pronounce it. But it's this beautiful song. But it's not even that it's not even that I like like the song. It's just for some reason I started listening to the song when I wrote, and now it's just every single time. And by the time that that song is done, I'm not even hearing the music anymore mm-hmm. because it's just become so unconscious. But something about that triggers my neural activity to say, "I, I know what we're doing here. We've done this before." And gets into it. So whatever those triggers are for you, they can be very, very useful to get you into a work phase. Do you guys do anything like that? Like like while you're lifting or working? Amber, you're working, not working, yes. Yeah, uh, two doing? things. Uh, shoes. Shoes have to be on at least when I start. Like as soon as I put shoes on, my brain's like, it's time to work. Um, so I'm one of those gross people that wear shoes inside their house because otherwise nothing gets done. Um, and my hair goes in a ponytail. I cannot think with my hair down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shoes. And I, that, that doesn't, I need tennis shoes. Flip flops don't work. Yeah. It has to be tennis shoes. I need like the compression of the shoe. Um, so yeah. And your hair in a ponytail. Interesting. I cannot think with my hair down. Now, now do you, I know it's the only time. So here's my question. Is it the only time when you wear those shoes? Like, are those like your work shoes? Mm -mm. No. Okay. Okay. Mm -mm. So, so for me, it's, it's, it's important that it's the only time that I do those things. Like I, I like, I mean, if that song comes on another time, I don't like unconsciously start just going like this and like pretending like I'm typing in the air, but, 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 but still like the, um, the, yeah, anyway, the, the music is the same type of thing. 
it's yeah. the only time that I listen to it. So for you, I'm interested because it's not the only time. But it's all, it's always related to action, right? It's yeah. either they're, they're my tennis shoes either for working out or for doing. So it's, it's related to some sort of action. I don't hang out in them. If I'm going to relax, then the shoes come off. Um, so, but I mean, this is a lot of what is it, Todd Herman, Alter Ego? Like you see a lot of this kind of discussion. Um, in that book and it was really really good hmm. is using those little either mementos or um even like different names or whatever to help you kind of mentally switch gears was it a good book loved it Alter loved Eagle, it was it i've known todd for a lot of years uh and so he's i have i like i think i had three copies of the book over the years just from like being given to me at various stages uh but i never read the book because i've known him so i've talked to him but yeah and i figure there's probably not much more to it but yeah no he's He's smart. Give it a shout out. Alter ego. <laughs> yeah. uh, Amber says it's a good book. It's a good. I know it's a good idea. For what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's one I actually finished. So I think that should count for something. That's nice. It, so. Oh, hell yeah. All right. Nice. Should be a uh, separate. Anything you want to add to that win? Or, or should we get into uh, decision fatigue? No, nah, I'm pretty loose cannon. Like I operate <laughs> in all, all state. With one exception, I can't work out without my hat. I just, I can't get really? in the mood to work can't get in the mood to work out without a hat, man. Mm -hmm. You have a fresh cut. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter. When I literally will take one of these old Nike hats that you see me recycling here on the podcast out of mm -hmm. town with me if I have any expectations that I'm going to work out. It just, wow. it just puts cool. me in the mood to, it, I call them my work hats. Mm -hmm. And I don't need them for this, but to exercise, yes, I need them. Well, this doesn't work for you. This is just, right. this, yeah, this is something that somebody's... <laughs> He needed you for reasons that nobody can explain. Right. Uh, okay. Oh, Let's man. talk about decision fatigue. So this is something I'm, I'm super mm. passionate about. And I, this one takes a little bit of explaining. So it comes down to creative energy and willpower. Um, willpower is limited. I think a lot of people take that for granted. I think it's very important to eliminate as many decisions from your everyday life as possible. We use willpower to make decisions to focus and to be creative. Practicing what's called choice minimalism, which means eliminating as many decisions from your everyday life as possible, is going to help you save your valuable willpower for when it's needed. It sounds kind of silly, but... It makes a hell of a difference. And so at this point, this is actually a great opportunity to give a shout out to uh, our official sponsors of the show. We have an official sponsor of the show, which is a company that I love. It's a company called Unbound Merino, and they're a clothing company. And I call it my one shirt. If you notice, I'm always wearing black unlabeled t-shirt. And it is always from this one company. It was, I bought them from this company. I became friends with the owner. They started sending me stuff for free. And now they're officially sponsoring the podcast. So uh, the, I just, the idea behind it is that I, my, my goal in wearing clothing is to feel like I look good and be comfortable. Wearing more than one shirt or different types of shirts doesn't affect my desired outcome for that goal. For me, right? And so I feel like these t-shirts make me look really good. I feel like they fit really, really well. They're super comfortable. They're all made of merino wool, which is like the best material ever for a shirt. It doesn't ever smell. It's actually great workout stuff and training clients in as well because it doesn't ever smell. Um, it always looks good. doesn't get wrinkled or anything like that. And it like sits on your body well. I don't know if that's like a thing that like a lot of people look for. But for me, because I'm like a, a shorter guy with like broader shoulders, like a shirt that doesn't sit on my body well, it looks stupid because then like my belly button's showing. And uh, and so anyway, so I wanted to give them a shout out. Um, what's what's the deal? I know there's a discount if somebody uses the, the code Goodman. Is that yeah. what it is? I'll find a... I'll yeah, real quick. I should have been more prepared with this ad read. <laughs> but uh, but unboundmerino.com, um, we've got a coupon code for you, but Amber will get that in a second. And so, like, I'm not the only one to wear one shirt, like Mark Zuckerberg does it. Uh, he said, uh, what, did, what did Zuck say? 
Zuck said, uh, I really want to clear my life to make it so that I have to make as few decisions as possible about anything except how to best serve this community. Uh, the former president of the United States of America, Barack Obama, does the same thing. He has one shirt. He said, uh, I'm trying to pare down decisions. I don't want to make decisions about what I'm eating or wearing, he says, because I have too many other decisions to make. Decisions, no matter how seemingly small, are onerous. When you wake up in the morning, you have a finite amount of minutes and your willpower is limited. And so I suggest you spend your time doing the things you enjoy doing and eliminate as much else as possible. So here's some steps to um, reverse decision fatigue. The first is to actually track your decisions. You will be surprised at how many decisions you make over the course of a day. Do you have the code, Amber? Yeah, it's Goodman. To get 10% off their their first uh, purchase. Okay, so to get 10% off your first purchase at Unbound Merino, uh, and it'll be in the show notes too, uh, Mm -hmm. use the coupon code Goodman and... They've got everything. They just sent me their active or stuff. I've been working out in it. It's great. Uh, but but their t-shirts are just killer, man. Their t-shirts are so good. And so when you're tracking your decisions, keep a piece of paper, a note on your phone with you. I like doing it with a piece of paper, but you can do it like a note on your phone. And whenever you make a decision about anything, do this for like two days because it's annoying as all hell. Write it down. Like, What coffee did you order? What brand of eggs did you buy? What shirt are you wearing? What movie did you watch? You will be blown away by how many little, dumb, inconsequential decisions you make. And then at the end of the week, evaluate those decisions. Go through your list. Make a note of whether they actually affected your desired outcome. Like, like did did the fact that you made a decision in the moment affect anything? Most of the time, it won't. My example for the t-shirt, right? Did it affect my desired outcome of feeling like I look good and being comfortable? Does it matter whether I buy free range or organic or omega-3 or brown or white or medium or small or large or extra large eggs? No, of course not. There are 27 different types. When you put all those like combinations together, there's 27 different <laughs> types of eggs you could buy. You know how goddamn stupid that is? <laughs> there's 27 different types of eggs you can buy in the grocery store. If you know that every single time you buy the medium brown free range eggs, you've just eliminated a decision. Don't look at the price, whether it's 50 cents more or 50 cents less, your mental capacity is worth a hell of a lot more than that. And so once you've established what decisions to eliminate, take action and eliminate anything that consumes your valuable time and willpower. It could be as simple as simplifying your wardrobe. Like I said, I wear Unbound Merino. That's what I wear. It's the clothing company that I love. And now they're sponsoring so I can give them even more props. But I've been writing about them for years. Um, So it's not just that they're giving us money and I gave Ren a raise as a result. (laughs) But like another area where we make a lot of onerous decisions is deciding what to eat. And if you like to order lunch, for example, here's one of the things that I used to do when I ordered lunch a lot more was I, I, I set like, I use like the ordering, whatever, just eat.ca use like the food ordering apps. And I would set a few different favorite meals on the few on the food delivery and websites that I liked. And so then I would be like, Oh, I feel like Japanese or, Oh, I feel like Turkish or, Oh, I feel like whatever type Greek. And I would already have in the app, the restaurant and the meal that I liked. So then I could just I could just be there at lunch and I'd be like, I want Japanese. And I would just go click, click, click. Or when I had an assistant, she would know, okay, <laughs> click, click, click. And would order that meal from that place. Right? In advance. Now, all of this to say, if you really love clothing, maybe that's a place where you want to expend more energy. If you really love food. Maybe that's a place where you want to expend more energy. The point is with this whole decision fatigue and choice minimalism thing is identify what you really care about and optimize that. 
and put in this process to minimize the amount of energy and willpower it takes for everything else. Like for me, you want to know what matters, guys? My family, my work, and my fitness. That's it. Like I don't even want like anything else is an unwelcome distraction for me. But I also don't have a lot of hobbies. So that's decision fatigue. I got two more, but you guys can jump in on that if you want to. I think keep in mind, because I think one thing that, that may happen for people listening is a little bit of resistance to what they're hearing. Uh, because for for some of us, like, you know, so like for me, I'm pretty privileged in that I have my parents that help with Nate, for example. So there are definitely people that are going to be listening that don't have those same kind of privileges. And so like focus on what you can control and not get too into the weeds with some of the advice, right? Like it's, it's easy to like, well, you have this and you have that, right? Like it's easy to get combative almost um, with some advice, especially around this kind of stuff, because we, we almost feel broken that we can't do these things. So focus on what you can control and let go of the rest. I'm not sure I completely follow. So this is actually just from my own experience. So for me, as I'm listening, I can hear the internal thoughts of like, well, that doesn't work for me because oh, I don't have access to that or I don't have access to that or that doesn't work for me because my brain works this way or that way. Mm. So I can very much imagine other people listening and, and, and not taking the advice and, and making it work for them and discounting it altogether because right. of that. So yeah, it's the focus idea, on what you can it's the control. Idea behind it. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Like, like my goal with this episode is to throw a whole bunch of things at you that mm -hmm. my hope is that you are able to hear one or two of them and be like, oh, that would be a measurable improvement for me. That works for me. As opposed to saying, oh shit, I can't do all these things. Right. Yeah. And then your version of it may not work for them. And my version of it may not work for them. So you have to take the gist of it and experiment. Yeah. And the first 30 times you try it may not work. You know, it's, and you have oh, to yeah. figure it out. The whole thing about waking up early in the morning and getting those two hours of work. I mean, that's like years in process. To, right. To finally get into that routine. And the hard thing about that is any social commitment or anything like that, that keeps me up later, just screws me up. Like I, I love waking up early. Mm -hmm. Like I love the idea of it. I love how it makes me feel over the course of the day. The problem is one late night and you're screwed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's no catching up so folks who have a lot more social commitments uh than i do because they have a lot more friends than i do uh <laughs> really the whole message here is just to not have a lot of friends uh it, it, can, be tough. <laughs> it can be tough um let's let's continue on with email because it'll be pretty quick but i think controlling your email inbox is a pretty important thing and then um i'm going to end with dream week which i know that you guys are pretty familiar with so Talking about email real quick, the misconception or, or the general philosophy here that I want to communicate is that email isn't a task. Email is where tasks accumulate. So inside of your email at any given time, there's probably a whole bunch of different things. And the most common behavior is to click on them, read it and say, oh shit, I don't have time to deal with this or I don't want to deal with this now. Mark it as unread and move on to the next. That is a takes a lot of energy B like takes a lot of time and you haven't actually accomplished anything. So what I started doing a while ago, because I got so goddamn frustrated with myself in doing this was that I figured out that there were a couple key categories of tasks that basically all of my emails fell into. I mean, not all like somebody just emailed me an introduction to somebody who has another company in I'm going to say no to him for what he wants, but like, it's an email that is a different type of request, right? That doesn't happen too often. For the most part, my emails are any combination of, Hey, I need you to pay me, which is a lot of 
what I do. Uh, Cause when you own a company, it just seems like you just have to pay everybody all day. That's just like all that you do. What? Not uh, out of the goodness of their hearts. What? No, no. So, you know, invoices. So like, I just call it need to pay and I'll create a folder in my email. So my Gmail has a label for all of these categories. So like need to pay when I was training clients and stuff like that, it was programs to write. Um, it was non urgent requests. Mm -hmm. And then I had, um, uh, what was one? Now I use Evernote for it, but you could use email as well. But it was, it was basically like interesting stuff to read on the internet. So, you know, if I come across something that I want to read, a blog post, an article, whatever, a book that I think might be good on the Kindle, because I don't, I don't buy books when I see them now. What I'll do is I'll download a sample on my Kindle and then I'll read the sample. And if I like it, then I'll buy the book either on Kindle or, or, um, or in paperback. And so what I'll do is I'll send these all, I'll clear my inbox. So I'll go through my inbox because in, in almost every case, when you get an email in, you know which category the thing is in, right? You might not know exactly what it says, but you know which category it's in. And so what I'll do is I'll, is I'll label them. So I'll go in once a day and I'll label all my emails and put them in their folders. And then over the course of the week at different times, I have times to deal with each of the labels mm -hmm. or the need to pay. I just, I pay people at the end of the month. So I just do that. So anytime anybody sends me an invoice for anything, I just keep it in there. And then once a month near the end of the month, I, uh, I go in and I pay everybody that. And, and, and of course, if there's an urgent client inquiry, or if it's like a new client inquiry, like you might even create a filter in your Gmail to give that a star and like put it at the top of your inbox. Like you can create all these filters um, to do that. And the most important part of all of this is this overall theme, which is email isn't a task. It's where tasks go to accumulate. Don't go in there and say, I'm going to work on my email. Instead, say, uh, I'm going to respond to non- to all non-urgent client inquiries on Tuesdays and Thursdays from three to four. I'm going to put on some public enemy, some 1990s hip hop, <laughs> and I'm going to rip these out. <laughs> Whatever it is, right? You might need more time. You might need less time for each of these individual tasks. That's going to be different um, for you. But uh, I have found that that's helped me not be as anxious towards email. All the time. The final thing I want to talk about is this dream week idea. Before so, we hit that, can I mention yeah. something? Yeah, so with before. email, um, so with Gmail and specifically, you can set up multiple inboxes and then set up the filters to set up. So not just labels, but you can have up to five inboxes and I have a filter system. And so they sit side by side. I have my regular inbox and then I have additional inboxes. So like if anybody from the OTA emails me, it goes straight to that, that inbox. And so it, it separates it for me that way. Oh, cool. Um, and then I skip the inbox. Um, so I do the same thing for that. And then also unroll me or unroll dot me is a lifesaver. Cause if you're anything like me and you sign up for things because things sound cool or you want to listen to or see a newsletter and then you have an inbox full of junk that you never actually read, um, you can mass unsubscribe and then mm. also uh, create a roll up email. And so all of the not important emails that I get, they come in one weekly email or I think it's choose weekly or daily, but it comes in one email and they're all in that email. And mm. so that way I can, again, keep it less overwhelming. In the oh, that's kind of cool. See, yeah. I just don't subscribe for anything, but uh, <laughs> except for except for the emails from uh, from Five Reps Friday, uh, uh, which is the most popular free newsletter on the web. That's what I've for heard. People who work in fitness, it's a fantastic email. You can subscribe at www.fiverepsfriday.com. Uh, join about 74, 75,000 others. Uh, you get um, two coaching concepts, two uh, business nuggets, and a, and a quote to ponder. People, people really love that email. Uh, so if you are subscribed to that, don't unsubscribe. Uh, please, please, Gad. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and no, I mean, unsubscribe if you don't like it, whatever. I don't want you on that list if you don't like it. <laughs> but I think that you'll love it. The yeah, no, that the, the mass unsubscribe, I've done that in the past. I've never done it like ongoing. 
but I've yeah. I've used those services in the past just to just to see because especially my email is on a whole bunch of different like business lists and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and uh, and it, it gets so when you own the company, it just get your email just gets sold all over the place. Yeah, it's obnoxious. Uh, and uh, and it, and it's ongoing, right? Which is why, but I mean, you know, I pull up Beyonce once every few years and just kill my email and start new. Or forward it to Amber at the PTDC.com so she gets all the emails. <laughs> and <then I> started. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I don't actually forward that one to you. <laughs> That's a good tip. The The roll up email is kind of cool. So it pulls in like all your subscriptions into one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Okay. Finishing off, I want to talk about this idea of the dream week. This is something that is actually a really central part of the Online Trainer Academy. And in a lot of things that I teach. I don't use this now. I use this whenever my schedule gets out of whack. And whenever I feel like I'm out of control and being very responsive, I go through this exercise. And so the exercise is, I like to do it on pen and paper, but I draw out a week. So probably Monday to Friday, unless you do some training on the weekends, maybe you'll include those days. But Monday to Friday, the full day when I wake up to go to sleep. And I'll schedule in every 30 minutes. My perfect week in, in the best week in the world, right? In an ideal scenario, this is what I'd be doing every 30 minutes. And it might be take a nap. It might be read a book. It might be work out. It might be build my content. It might be build my client programs. It might be training your clients. Like, like whatever it is for you, fill it in in your week and then actually put that into your calendar, whatever you use. I use Google calendar, whatever you use, they're all fine. I put that into my calendar in a, in, in a light color. So I use a light blue. And then as your week builds up, anything that you schedule that has to be in there, you'll see what it's now replacing from your ideal week. And so it doesn't mean that you can't schedule over it. You can, you can absolutely schedule over it, but by doing this exercise where you say in an ideal week, I'm going to take my kid to the park during that time, two things happen. You now have a visual of what it's replacing whenever you decide to accept to do something, right? Or your work or whatever it is that you're doing. And again, it doesn't mean that you don't do it. It's just like, now you know what it's replacing. So that's really useful. The second is if you're ever like sitting around in a doom scroll or you're wondering what to do or whatever, you can always just refer back to this thing that you made in a very, very good state of mind in an objective sense and said, oh no, at this time, I'm going to be reading a book. And it's just a nice trigger to be like, okay, shut off phone, pick up a book beside you and read it. And so whenever I feel myself getting out of whack because life just kind of piles on and piles on and piles on and piles on and it's very easy to add, it's very difficult to subtract, I go through this exercise again where I just rewrite down my dream week. And it's always a bit different every time that I do it. But I rewrite down my dream week and I kind of reset my schedule to the best of my ability at that time. There's always stuff that I have to do that anybody has to do over the course of the day, but that helps get me back on track and keep me in check. So to, so to, to clarify or to add a finer point to it, this is not a, I have to follow this to the letter thing. This is a prioritization and cutting out excess exercise. Yes. Yes. Because I remember going through the academy the first time and I wanted to curse you out because of that exercise. I was like, this is the dumbest thing. It's hard. <laughs> it's, it's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Well, it was because I can't follow that because my day is constantly changing. And so a thought is, or another potential exercise here, because I don't, I don't know about you, but for me, when I went through that exercise, even through the lens of this is a way to prioritize, I failed every single time right? Because I like, I never got to do the thing. 
um, you know, when roundabout, you know, so even if it wasn't intended to do that for me personally, cause I'm, I'm a sensitive person, um, you know, it would, it would create a little bit of like shame, you know, around it. And so for me, just as a, an alternative is having like, you're using it as almost like a list of things to do and how much time and being able to fit it in almost like a puzzle because every day is different. And so that yeah. way it becomes a game for me to figure out, okay, how can I fit in this five minute task and this 10 minute task and this hour task? And then that way, every single thing that I complete is a bonus, not, oh crap, I didn't do this even though I had it on my calendar. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. You, you, you absolutely do not look at it as saying, this is what I have to do. And there's no mm -hmm. guilt if you don't. Logically, you know that. <laughs> well, all you're doing is you're painting a picture and saying, you know, ideally, this is what I'm, mm -hmm. this is what I'm working towards. And in seeing this, I can put everything else into perspective. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, a lot of us are not in control of our time, some more than others. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of us are not in control of our time that much. I feel you. Mm -hmm. Man, I like this is what I keep talking to Allison about. She's like, Oh, how's the work on the book going? I'm like, It's fine, but <laughs> I keep getting pulled away from it. Like like I in order to write something like this, in order to produce anything I think that really matters, it kind of requires you to be in it and thinking about it for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. Going to bed thinking about it, waking up thinking about it, and I just don't have that ability right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm an hour here, I'm an hour there. By the time I'm just getting into the thing, mm -hmm. I'm jumping out of it. Yep. Uh, and I mean, I'm kind of like, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not in a rush for this day to come because being a dad is the freaking best, man. We had such a good weekend with the kids, but. At the same time, there's like a part of me that just, it's like, yeah, I've been reading these books and like Stephen King and, and the Neil Gaiman story and stuff. It's like, they've grown up kids. They wake up, they have their coffee, they go down <laughs> to their gazebo, they're writing their book, they're having a nap in the middle of the day. It's like, holy shit, man, if I could write a bunch of books now, imagine how many goddamn books I'm going to be able to write when my kids are grown mm -hmm. up. Yeah. You know? For sure. Um, Cool. Anything, anything to add to, to all of this? Amber, I really liked how you gave different perspective to a bunch of these because obviously we work very differently, which is why we work, I think, so well together. Mm -hmm. I think we complement each other really, really well. So it was, it was really nice for anybody listening to see those two sides of it. Sure. And then when, you know, you're out here. here. <laughs> I, I do have I do have some closing commentary though. If if nothing okay. else, I'll recommend things, an episode afterwards, and then you do okay. your, you, you if, do your if, closing commentary, and then I recommend an episode. And if nothing else, these tools allow you something that most people deny themselves pretty much the entirety of their life, and that's awareness. Like most people are just on the rock hurtling through space with the other people, man. Like, and that's it's just not a it's not a great way to live, and it's not a great way to feel like you've had a fulfilled life. So. If you're not getting anything else out of the strategy, if you're not utilizing the strategy, maybe once or twice just to see what's going on with your actual existence, it can be really, really impactful for you to know. I said yes to this thing, uh, and I never realized that I said also said no to playing at the park with my kids because I said yes to this thing. Or mm -hmm. I said no to this thing, and I felt bad about it until I compared it against my dream week, and I realized I spent more time with my spouse because I had because I turned down that other person who was not my spouse, and there's no reason for me to feel awful about it. It was actually a logical choice. It served my intention for my life because so many people are just coasting, man. Like we get them in the on, in the online trainer academy all the time. They just just day to day, no rhyme or reason. And awareness can really be a great catalyst for change in the one existence that you get on the planet. Um, yeah. John That's Rickett. such a good point. Yeah, just, it's this it's this idea of just studying oneself, isn't it? Just knowing, just, you know, there's no right or wrong. It's just it's just mm -hmm. it's just study yourself, man. Like like how well do you work? How can you best? All of these tools that have been designed to make us better, to help us do more, 
are actually not solving our problems. Mm-hmm. They're just giving us different problems. They're making us think that we need to achieve more when actually most of us probably should do less. They're, they're getting us focused on the wrong things. Mm-hmm. And, and, and all that I think a lot of what we spoke about today does is yeah, give you awareness. It's such a good point, man. Give you awareness to this stuff. All right. What's another great episode, John? I'm wondering. You know, I'm so happy that you'd ask. <laughs> if you are looking for another episode to listen to right now because you just can't get enough, <laughs> mm-hmm. then I'm going to recommend episode number 51. It's mm-hmm. called Why Goal Setting Leads to Disaster. And the reason that I'm going to recommend this is because it has a lot to do with systems oriented thinking. A lot of conventional goal setting, the way that we've been taught, the way that we do it is, hey, here's this end goal. Once I get there, everything is going to be better. And then I'm going to live happily ever after. Well, that ain't how this shit works. Because once you get there, there becomes your new here. And there now becomes established a new there. Mm -hmm. And it's just this continual cycle. And so goal setting can lead to disaster for both you and your clients, depending on on whatever you want to do. And this episode, episode 51, we talk about the importance of systems oriented thinking, particularly systems that have leakage involved, where you have to anticipate that something is going to go wrong, that something is going to happen that's unplanned. Because life's messy, life's unpredictable, and something will go wrong. Something will happen that's unplanned. And whatever system that you build has to assume that that's going to happen and have leakage involved to be able to work within that. And so that's episode 51. I think I did a great sales job for that just now. Very happy with myself. That was very uh, good. Yeah, Yeah, not bad, right? Uh, Episode 51, my goal setting leads to disaster. Just scroll back in the um, new app. Come find that. And as always... Uh, rate and review this podcast wherever you rate and review podcast. However, the heck you rate and review podcast. Again, I've never done it for any other podcast, but I'm told <laughs> that it helps podcasts do whatever podcasts do to help other people find podcasts. So if you know how to rate and review a podcast, which I don't know how to do, so I can't tell you, but if you know how to do that, please rate and review this podcast. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Talk soon.